Okay, we're going to start. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, on today's stated agenda. Uh, today, the council will be voting on two budget modifications. The expense budget modification, which is MN6, and it's going to transfer $970.3 million between various units of appropriation in the current fiscal year, when, uh, fiscal year 2018, with a zero net effect on the budget. The revenue budget modification, MN7, would recognize $783.8 million in new revenues for the current fiscal year we're in, fiscal year 2018. These two revenues combined with other funds uh, totals $2.58 billion will be added to the budget stabilization account to prepay debt service for fiscal year 2019. The council will also vote on a number of land use items. A few of the highlights, Gowanus Canal CSO facility. The council will vote to approve an application by DEP to construct combined sewer overflow control facilities to reduce the volume of untreated wastewater entering the Gowanus Canal. This project is located in council member Steve Levin's district. 35 Underhill Avenue rezoning. The council will vote to rezone 35 Underhill Avenue to permit the conversion of space from parking to retail. This project is located in Majority Leader Lori Cumbo's district. 21 East 12th Street. The council will vote to modify an application or reduce the size of a parking facility. This project is in Council Member Carlina Rivera's district. West 127th Street support of housing. I'm really proud of this. The council will vote to approve a set of applications to build 117 units of affordable and supportive housing uh, with on-site supportive services. This project is in Council Member Bill Perkins's district. And the Taxi and Limousine Commission office lease. The council will vote on a motion to file the application to remove it from the council's calendar after it was withdrawn. This was in Council Member Cabrera's district. Uh, the council will also vote on a number of critical pieces of legislation today. First, the council will vote on introduction 754, sponsored by Council Member Rafael Espinal, which adds two additional members to the Nightlife Advisory Board, increasing the total number of members from 12 to 14. Council Member Espinal is unable to join us today, but uh, I am supportive of this. Uh, next, the council will vote on introduction 241B, which is sponsored by public advocate Letitia James, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, and myself, which would establish a Charter Revision Commission to draft a new or revised city charter. The commission would have appointees from a wide array of city elected officials, including the mayor, the borough presidents, public advocate, the controller, and the city council. The commission created by this bill would not have a predetermined set of issues to consider, but would instead be empowered to examine broader questions of New York City government. I want to invite Borough President Gail Brewer to speak on this piece of legislation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for your support of this issue. So the charter, as we know, more or less exists from what was created in 1989. Ed Koch was mayor. Soviet Union still existed, <laughs> and the first written proposal for the World Wide Web was written in 1989, for those of you who weren't born then, in case you don't know. Um, there have been seven charter revisions since, um, often for a couple of months, mostly in the summer. Uh, they were done for specific political purposes, Yankee Stadium, none were very comprehensive. I testified at all of them, so I know. So what we have proposed with the speaker and the public advocate is number one, a comprehensive review of the charter because that's what the charter vision calls for in the charter, what's worked, what needs improvement, and enough time to do it well. We're also calling for that, a year and a half, real hearings, real input from the community, and 15 commissioners appointed by the city's leaders so no one elected can dominate and tell the commission where to go or what to do. As we know, four from the mayor, four from the council, one each from the public advocate and the controller, and one each from the five borough presidents. It's easy to stick with what you know and what you've always done. It's harder, it takes courage to reevaluate the ground rules when you've worked under the same rules for 30 years. As I indicated, I definitely want to thank Speaker Johnson and the city council for their support. It means a great deal to me, and they understand, you understand governance. And I want to thank all the borough presidents. Um, if asked, you know, this bill is incredibly important because of the reasons that I've just outlined and because it will set an independent uh, way of looking at the charter. So I am very, very appreciative of the city council, and we look forward to a vibrant 
uh, discussion that is done in the time period necessary to have a real charter revision. And just think, eight, 1989 was a long time ago. Thank you. Did you testify in 89? I was part of the sort of uh, rogue groups because I was working for Ruth <laughs> Messenger. And That's Eric like Lane, <laughs> Eric Lane, who's still at Hofstra, was the head of everything there, along with Mr. Schwartz. Thank you. Thank you, Borough Thank President Brewer. Uh, and lastly, the council is taking a major step today in protecting all, especially women in the workplace, with the Stop Sexual Harassment in New York City Act. With the Me Too and Time's Up movements, we have seen that women are forces to be reckoned with, and they made loud and clear that enough is enough. The beginning of the end starts here in New York City. All New Yorkers are entitled to a safe, respectful workplace, and this package of legislation sends a strong message to public and private employers that there is no place for sexual harassment in our city. I want to thank my council colleagues for their support in pushing this package of bills forward and leading the charge here in New York City. I especially want to thank uh, Chair Rosenthal, the chair of the Committee on Women. Um, and I want to thank all my council colleagues for their support in pushing this package of bills forward and leading the charge here in our city. Uh, my bill, Introduction 612A, would require city agencies as well as the Office of the Borough Presidents, the Comptroller, the Public Advocate, to conduct anti -ant annual anti-sexual harassment training for all of their employees. Introduction 613A, sponsored by Councilmember Adrian Adams, would require city agencies, as well as the Offices of Borough Presidents, Comptroller, and Public Advocate, to conduct an ongoing assessment of risk factors associated with sexual harassment at such agency in order to help provide a fair and safe work environment for all city workers. I want to invite uh, Councilmember Adams to speak on her bill. Thank you very much, Speaker Johnson. We are very proud to stand here today in front of you as taking the leading charge against sexual harassment in New York City. As we know, we have seen the Me Too movement grow by leaps and bounds, and we feel as a unified city council that the city council and the city of New York should be leaders. We should be on the forefront of combating this scourge across our city and, yes, across our nation. We are taking a first step today in introducing this very strong, unprecedented package of legislation, which will be passed by the New York City Council to combat sexual harassment in New York City, New York City agencies. We hope that this will be the model for the rest of the country to take in, in ridding ourselves of sexual harassment. We'd like to again thank Speaker Johnson, the leadership of Helen Rosenthal, my colleague, and all of the women and men who said, me too, we are going to stand up and fight against sexual harassment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, introduction 614A, and she just arrived, is sponsored by Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel, and it would require the New York City Commission on Human Rights to conspicuously post on its website resources about sexual harassment, including an explanation that sexual harassment is a form of unlawful discrimination under local law. And I want to invite Councilmember Amprey Samuel to come up and discuss her bill today. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm proud to introduce 16, um, 614A that will require information about sexual harassment be made available online for public access. This bill, like I've said before, is just quite simple. It just makes sense. And it's almost intriguing that in the 21st century, we're having this conversation about online access to information. And, but it's the world that we live in. We live in a technology age, a digital age, in a time where anything and everything is available at our fingertips. And when you think about sexual harassment and filing a complaint, you often think about standing in front of a water cooler looking at a poster, or you think about looking um, at like some kind of billboard in front of a bathroom, or even um, having a conversation, um, not just in the cafeteria, but it's just always just like some type of poster board. But that's a whole other level of a violation because you seem to want to be in some kind of privacy when it comes to filing a complaint. And so with this particular piece of legislation, you're able to do that in a, either the privacy of your home or with someone that you feel confident in. And um, it just, again, makes sense. And so 
this process is a way to be able to make someone feel empowered. And just as a woman, as a professional woman, I've often had conversations with my colleagues about also being in a position where I've had my own Me Too moments, but not necessarily knowing how to go about providing that level of confidence and information to be able to do something about it. And so I just stand here proud to be able to introduce this piece of legislation that again will be able to provide another level of an option for women or anyone who's been violated or feel violated to have an opportunity to, um, to do something about it. And so um, with that, I thank the speaker and my colleagues for this opportunity and I just look forward to the bill passing. Thank you. Um, so introduction 630A is sponsored by council members Robert Cornegy and Majority Leader Lori Cumbo. It would require all employers in the city to conspicuously display anti-sexual harassment rights and responsibility posters designed by the Commission on Human Rights. The poster would be designed to use simple and understandable terms. I want to invite council member Cornegy to come up and discuss this. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Uh, as a proud member and co-chair of the Men Who Get It Caucus. Um, as you all know, the past year or more and the rapid growth of the Me Too movement has been a rude awakening to the pervasive culture of sexual harassment and assault that has infected our society for far too long. As the father of two intelligent, strong, engaging young women, I cannot simply stand by while the chorus of voices saying Me Too grows louder. So today I'm proud to stand shoulder to shoulder I guess, yeah. <laughs> with my colleagues in the council in passing the Stop Sexual Harassment in New York City Act, which will strengthen New York City's anti-sexual harassment protections to include all public and private employees in this city. As part of that package, I'm proud to be the prime sponsor, along with Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, of a bill that will require the New York City Commission on Human Rights to design an anti-sexual harassment rights and responsibilities poster and require employers in New York City to display this poster in a conspicuous location where employees gather. While there's much work to be done to change the culture of sexual harassment in this country, I firmly believe that actions like these and leadership from those who should be leading will have a positive impact in creating a culture of mutual respect and understanding that will help move us forward. I'd like to thank uh, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal and Speaker Johnson for their leadership on this, and I'd like to give a special shout out to Jamani williams Sue. <laughs> Introduction 632A is sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo and Public Advocate Letitia James. It would require, this is, a, a, I think, a very significant, all of them are significant, but this is a very significant uh, portion of the package of bills today. It would require all private employers in New York City, all private employers with 15 or more employees to conduct anti-sexual harassment interactive training for all of the employees of such employer, including interns and supervisory and managerial personnel after 90 days of the initial hire. Employers may use computer or online training programs to satisfy the requirements of this bill. You're going to hear later at the stated meeting, uh, the public advocate and the majority leader speak on this bill. Introduction 653A, sponsored by council members Mark Levine, Jumani Williams, Richie Torres, and Fernando Cabrera, would require city agencies, as well as the offices of the borough presidents, the comptroller, and the public advocate to annually report on incidents of workplace sexual harassment within city agencies through the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS. I want to I want to invite Councilmember Williams to come up and talk about this bill. And my suit. And your suit. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, with the, the Me Too movement and the No More movement, uh, as, a, as a man, I would try to find the best way that I could be helpful. And as I began to speaking uh, to people, women around me, friends, uh, it became amazingly clear that the things I was hearing about uh, in the news and the everybody who was speaking weren't one-off conversations, that there was actually a culture that's been pervasive and allowed to exist for far too long. And I realized that the best way it could be helpful was one to listen, uh, one to hear and believe, uh, and get ready to follow marching orders and be the best ally that I could be. In that vein, I'm, I'm proud to have worked uh, with the speaker and especially uh, the chair, uh, Rosenthal, uh, to speedily move these pieces of legislation forward. Proud to co-prime uh, with the prime uh, council member Levin, uh, because one of the things, one of the factors that permits sexual harassment is the way that we allow it to fester. It's like been hiding in plain sight for far too long, and it's been a poison in the workplace. And 
Councilmember Levin's bill and myself, which is, you know, obviously I'm a proud co-prime, will help shine a light on the scope of the problems by requiring reporting of sexual harassment complaint made in city agencies. We cannot solve the problem if we cannot see it for the urgent danger that it is, and hopefully this package of legislation will help prevent that, and my hope is that the lessons going forward, because all of the signs, all of the things were there, it seems like many of us willfully ignored it, and so I hope that's a, a lesson going forward. These cultures of things that are allowing people to be oppressed are we brought out to the light before we hurt other people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I want to invite uh, the public advocate up. I, uh, public advocate James, I mentioned the bill that you and majority of the Combo are passing today, uh, just before Council Member Williams stepped up, requiring uh, employers with 15 and more employees to require to conduct anti-sexual harassment interactive training, and also Borough President Brewer spoke about the Charter Revision Commission. So I welcome you up to talk about both of your bills today. I want to thank the speaker and obviously join with my colleagues here in government and so of the package of bills to address uh, sexual harassment, uh, not only uh, in the city of New York, but throughout um, in all agencies. And I particularly want to thank um, Gail Brewer, the Manhattan Borough President, for partnering with me on the Charter Revision Bill. It's uh, not every day that we get an opportunity to fundamentally change the future of our city for the better. <laughs> because we all know that the Charter is our Constitution, and the Constitution is a living, uh, breathing document, and it really needs uh, to reflect all of the changes in the city of New York. And we've not had a comprehensive Charter review um, in the city of New York for over 30 years. Um, and we know that a lot has certainly changed over the past 30 years, and in the past, the Charter revision has been used um, as a cynical um, extension of, unfortunately, petty politics. Uh, from the West Side Stadium to stop a grassroots referendum that would limit the size of public classes. But the letter of the law basically says that you should have a comprehensive review of the charter whenever you have a charter revision commission. And the borough president, as well as the speaker, uh, and myself and my colleagues in government, obviously are following uh, the letter of the law. Um, and this is our chance to make a real and lasting difference in how New York City grows and adapts. And it's our chance to put thoughtful time and consideration towards the big questions that our city faces in the city of New York, how we plan for future growth, um, how we exercise the power of the purse, and most importantly, how we implement it and, and um, uh, implement uh, uh, checks and balances on the office of the mayoralty. It's also important that this commission be reflective of the city of New York, and that is why we want to make sure that there would be a broader way, array of appointing authorities and that no one official would appoint a majority of members, and that the commission um, be uh, diverse, uh, democratic, and as representative po as is possible. And we want an independent commission, we want a thoughtful commission, and we want a commission that obviously will be do a thorough uh, uh, review of city government. And so again, I thank the speaker for allowing me to say a few words, and I thank the members of the city council, and I thank the Manhattan Borough President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Uh, next up, we have introduction 657A, sponsored by Councilmember Keith Powers, which would amend the New York City human rights law to apply provisions related to gender-based discrimination to all employers, regardless of the number of employees they're employing at the time. I invite Councilmember Powers to speak on this. Thank you. Thank you to the speaker. Uh, I'm very excited that the first bill that I'll get to pass as a city council member will be something that will be so impactful. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and I, uh, I'm glad that uh, so swiftly as a city council, we responded to a watershed moment in our city, state, and country. And I thank the speaker and the, and the members of the city council who, and, and, our, and, and Councilman Rosenthal for leading the city forward to make sure that all New Yorkers are protected. Um, I introduced this bill in response to actually uh, an issue that was brought to me when I went, uh, right after I won, um, to the recognition that New York City did not protect employees who were in businesses of sizes one employee to four employees. New York State already does. A few years ago, the state legislature actually passed this protection. New York City having more favorable protections for employees did not have this protection. And I thought, and I think we all recognize, that every single employee in New York City should live in a harassment-free workplace. And so at the state and at the city level, roughly about 60% of our private employees are working in businesses that are in that sort of 
captured, that, that this bill captures. So uh, I'm very, very uh, happy that I'll be able to extend that we will be able to extend those protections to many employees in New York City. I want to thank both um, uh, the speaker, I want to thank, again, Councilman Rosenthal, all the sponsors, and everybody here who uh, introduced legislation and will be voting on legislation today for making this a prior priority for the City Council and for the City of New York so early in our tenure as City Council. So thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Congratulations. Uh, I forgot to congratulate Councilmember Amprey Samuel. This is her piece of legislation uh, passing as a Councilmember. Councilmember Adams, uh, similarly. Uh, Councilmember Powers, and we're going to hear next from Councilmember uh, Rivera and her bill, 650A, would amend the policy statement of the New York City Human Rights Law to expressly include sexual harassment as a form of discrimination that the City Human Rights Commission would have the power to eliminate and prevent uh, through their um, capabilities. So I invite her up to speak on her first bill that she's passing as a member of the council. Thank you for that. I wasn't gonna bring it up, but it is my first bill. I just know we have so much work to do and I'm looking forward to passing many more important and critical pieces of legislation that affect the workplace, women, trans women, people of color, and typically groups that have been disenfranchised and marginalized uh, historically. So this is important because too many times we leave best practices and a lot of discretion to employers. And what we have to do in order to hold people accountable is to codify language and to pass strong laws. And that's what we're doing today. This is one bill as a part of a larger package. And I thank the speaker for your leadership and all of the women in the Women's Caucus, of course, and my colleagues in the city council. That is why I'm here in the council, to pass bills like this that help all New Yorkers and really make sure that harassment, sexual misconduct is not tolerated and it is not acceptable. So I want to thank you for your support. I'm really excited for <laughs> stated today and look forward to working with you all. Thank, thank you so much. Congratulations, Council Thanks. Member. Thank you. Uh, next up is, uh, I think, the real ringleader of this effort and someone who deserves an enormous amount of credit. Council Member Helen Rosenthal, the chair of our Committee on Women, has two bills up for vote today. Introduction 663A would amend, again, the New York City Human Rights Law to increase the statute of limitations for filing harassment claims based on unwelcome conduct that intimidates, interferes with, oppresses, threatens, humiliates, or degrades a person based on such person's gender from one year is the current statute of limitations, and this bill would increase it to three years from the time that the alleged incident of harassment occurred. That's her first bill. The second bill, introduction 664A, would require city agencies, again, as well as the offices of borough presidents, controller, and public advocate, to conduct climate surveys to assess the general awareness and knowledge of the city's uh, equal opportunity employment policy, including but not limited to sexual harassment policies and prevention at city agencies. I want to invite her up, but I also want to let you know that even before this newly constituted council uh, came in on January 1st, January 3rd, uh, she was pushing this uh, last year and the year before. She has been all over every single one of these bills since the start of the session, asking them to be amended, asking them to be strengthened. And so I'm really proud of her leadership on this and all the work she's done. So I call her up today to speak on her bills. Nice. Oh. Nice. Uh, I'm going to say something about that in a minute. Um, but I will say this package of legislation is a terrific first step toward ending sexual harassment in the workplace. You heard the myriad ideas. Everyone brought their vision to the table. And I'm just so proud to be working with you all as colleagues. So in total, Speaker Johnson's 11 bill package, the Stop Sexual Harassment in New York City Act, reflects his unwavering commitment to those who have come forward in the Me Too movement. The sweeping legislative package isn't about checking the box. It's really important to say because when we look at every other municipality, they have checked the box, not this package. This package says we mean it, we're for real, we're doing the training, the training's gonna include bystander intervention, 
Uh, we're going to check up to make sure the training worked. We're going to do a risk assessment. We're going to require action plans so that the workplace is terrific for municipal workers, the largest workforce in New York City, and for it to apply to the private sector. I mean, Councilmember Powers, I know you're texting right now, but... Um, We're testing how fabulous your bill is. <laughs> nicely done. Well, I'll double check that. But, um, you know, the notion that you would act so quickly with uh, one of your constituents. And um, Councilmember Rivera, I mean, the truth of the matter is, Borough President Brewer has been doing this for the last 12 years. We have to acknowledge that. So she's been an incredible role model and leader uh, on supporting women in office and everywhere. Um, and thank goodness for Queens. We have a lot of good bills from Queens. And, um, and, and Alika Ampri Samuels remembering that it's not so comfortable for people to talk about this in the office or to seek help from a colleague or if you just don't know what's going on, now you can do it, you know, quietly, online, learn what the rules are, know your protections, and know that you can get an advocate to help you through the process. So I didn't mean to say any of that, but it's an amazing <laughs> package of bills. Um, my bill, intro 664A, requires every city agency and department regularly survey its employees to get perceptions of actual sexual harassment in the workplace. But I do want to say our package is just a beginning. This council will continue to push forward to find more ways to interrupt abuses of power and sexual harassment and make gender-based discrimination a thing of the past. I really do want to thank Speaker Johnson for making this a priority in um, the mere nascence of his speakership. You know, when I first came to the speaker as the new chair of the Committee of Women and said, uh, I'd really like that my first hearing be about uh, sexual harassment in the workplace and that we have a strong package of bills. He said, yeah, on it. Uh, staff is already working on it. We've got other members submitting ideas. Yeah, go. I mean, who does that? Uh, you do that. And I really want to acknowledge and thank your leadership on this entire package. It's groundbreaking. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is introduction 693, sponsored by Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer, and it would require that contractors and subcontractors that apply for city contracts include their employment practices, policies, and procedures as they relate to preventing and addressing sexual harassment in the employment report required of proposed contractors and subcontractors. This is actually a very creative idea that Councilmember Bramer came up with, and I'm really excited that this is part of our package of bills, so I invite him up to speak on this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to just uh, share a very quick personal story that I think a lot of, uh, sadly and tragically, a lot of the women in, in the room uh, will not find that uncommon. So when I was in college, I went to work for a large nonprofit in Queens, and the very powerful executive director of the organization began saying uh, some comments to me about how I looked and how I dressed and how I fit into my clothes. Uh, that behavior then escalated to unwelcome touching, uh, including actually lifting me up, picking me up, and carrying me through the office in front of other staff members. Uh, there were other, even more egregious things that happened. So I was a very young person who was the victim of sexual harassment. Uh, I did actually file a complaint. Uh, I was retaliated against, and uh, it was a horrific experience. The truth is, though, that this behavior uh, has occurred for generations, uh, and women are uh, much more uh, the subjects of this harassment, intimidation, and even violence, much more so than men. Uh, but my personal experience obviously has made me uh, incredibly sensitive uh, to this issue. Um, but I uh, also know, uh, having six sisters, uh, that women 
uh, have faced these issues uh, that I faced almost on a daily basis uh, in so many of the different professions that my sisters uh, are employed in. So uh, I am indeed grateful to serve with this body uh, of elected sisters uh, and brothers uh, and with the speaker's leadership in making sure that the council takes a real affirmative stand. Uh, and I appreciate uh, uh, Chairwoman Rosenthal's uh, statements and also uh, so many people echoing that this is really the beginning, right? This is not the end of what we are to do uh, to make sure that the Me Too movement uh, is a, a permanent, permanent culture change and shift, not only in the city, but in the country and in the world. So my bill, uh, which I am proud of, uh, amends the city charter uh, and requires that uh, the Division of Labor Service Employee Reports now must include uh, these organizations reporting uh, to the authorities what their practices, policies, and procedures are as they relate to preventing and addressing sexual harassment. Uh, and again, particularly with those who receive government funding, uh, we have an obligation to make sure that those organizations, those leaders, uh, are doing the right thing by their employees. Uh, and I'm really proud to be a part of this body. And thank you, Speaker, for allowing this to be a part of it. Thank you. Before I call up Councilmember Miller, who has a resolution, I want to allow uh, Councilmember Levine uh, to come up. We uh, had Councilmember Williams speak uh, before about Introduction 653A, which you are the lead sponsor on with Councilmember Williams, uh, which would uh, require reporting on incidents of workplace sexual harassment within city agencies and the public advocate controller, or the borough presidents. So I invite you to come up and speak oh, about th that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll, I'll be brief, I'm sure. Councilmember Williams did a great job. Thank you for making this, uh, Mr. Speaker, one of the first big packages to move in this term. It says a lot about the priority that, that you and the body are giving to this critical issue. And thank you to, uh, to Helen Rosenthal, who as chair of the Women's Committee, has been brilliant and strategic and determined in pushing this incredibly impactful package forward. And I'll just observe that as the Me Too movement has exposed this horrible epidemic of sexual harassment and, and industry after industry from Hollywood, to Congress, we would really be naive to think that city government was immune. Uh, we have a workforce of over 300,000, and we need to confront the difficult reality that there are victims amongst uh, city workers. And until now, we've never had data on that. We actually don't know how many cases, uh, as policymakers, the public, uh, there's been. So this bill would require annual reporting on every single agency. Um, not just of those cases which are substantiated, but also those cases which are found to be unsubstantiated and those cases uh, in which uh, the complaint withdraws the complaint. So it's really a complete picture uh, broken down by agency so that we can grapple to scale the problem uh, and confront it head on. Um, thank you again uh, to the leaders for making this possible. And uh, lastly, we have Resolution 222, sponsored by Councilmember Danique Miller, which calls upon Congress to pass and the President to sign <laughs> S.2203 and H.R., that's the Senate bill, and H.R. 4734, known as the Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Harassment Act in 2017, which prohibits a pre-dispute arbitration agreement from being valid or enforceable if it requires arbitration of a sex discrimination uh, dispute. Uh, we've seen these um, terrible pre dispute dis arbitration agreements exist, which has silenced victims and has come to light through people speaking out, even though they were silenced initially um, through the horrific traumatic process they had to go through in the aftermath of being harassed. And so this calls upon Congress to do that. And I want to invite Councilmember Miller to come up and speak on this. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you to all my colleagues for the, the great work that we've done on this uh, package of bills. Um, that really is transformative of the culture that we have seen, not just here in New York City, but throughout the United States. And that uh, I'm really proud to be a part of this package and to stand with this council and the, and the great leadership of Corey Johnson uh, that addresses this. Um, the Me Too, and, and, and uh, by having Borough President uh, here and uh, some of the things that she's worked on over the past decade, along with uh, some of the other bills, I, I think that we really um, 
cover a, a plethora and, 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 and certainly not the entirety of all the things that are necessary. We dealt with uh, addressing city government and other aspects of sexual harassment. Well, this bill uh, obviously uh, covers uh, private sector and others, and this is to stop the, the forced arbitration. The one thing about this bill is um, obviously it, 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 there's an irony that it would require 45's uh, signature to be enacted. This bill was introduced long before Stormy Daniels, right? Just, just so we say that. Uh, so, so, um, but, but that is the culture. And so this package is going to ensure that our mothers, our wives, our sisters, and those within our workforce are treated with the dignity and respect that they deserve. And again, I'm really proud to be a part of that. But the resolution that we're putting forth in uh, 222 is calling on Congress to enact uh, the ending of forced arb arbitration of sexual, sexual harassment. The act, uh, which was introduced by Senator Gillenbrand and Congressman Budos, is in recognition of the fact that forced arbitration restricts those who have been sexually subject to sexual harassment uh, from accessing courts and potential relief and corrective measures that they deserve. We have seen, obviously, uh, in recent weeks and recent time, this has uh, really come to light that this is a, uh, a method of really diminishing the voice of victims and silencing them and, 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 uh, and uh, locking them into uh, agreements that doesn't allow them to tell their story. This bill will allow them to uh, have their redress in courts of law and so that their voice will be heard and that they will have uh, proper <coughs> corrective measures will be taken outside of an individual arbiter and, and in particular so that, um, as I said, a lot of the uh, legislation that we put forth today is addressing what we do here at home in city government, but this uh, resolution would address uh, corporate America and otherwise, so I'm really proud to be a part of it and proud to be a part of this body that recognizes it's time for, uh, to move forward with uh, equity in the workplace. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you very much. And then lastly, uh, we, just a couple of hours ago or an hour and a half ago, uh, in the Rules Committee, the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections, amended our rules of the City Council to align all of the bills that we're putting on other agencies in city government, other offices, uh, the controllers, the public advocate, the borough presidents, all of the things we're calling for for everyone else to do, we are amending the rules of the council today so that it all is required upon us as well. So I'm really proud that we're gonna be voting on that. It passed unanimously at the Rules Committee earlier today. And uh, with that, I look forward to taking your questions. Uh, yes, Will. Well, I don't want to um, violate the confidentiality of the person who brought this claim forward because um, it's important for us to protect that individual, but this was a consultative process and the Committee on Standards and Ethics handled this in a very serious, earnest way. They spent time on it. Uh, they talked to uh, attorneys. They talked to the general counsel here. They interviewed multiple people. Um, they spent an enormous amount of time. So what ended up being handed down from that committee was not a quick decision. It was something that a lot of time went into. There were multiple hearings involved. Um, and so, um, you know, again, I can't get into the specifics of the case, again, to protect uh, the person who decided to bring this uh, forward. Uh, but there was a penalty that was handed down. And it's my understanding that the penalty that was handed down, that council member has complied with what was asked uh, through the Standards and Ethics Committee. Anyone else? Uh, Aaron. Do you know, uh, just since when the mayor's been assigned to charge of the commission, has it gone a little time at the party? 
I don't know. I'm not sure. I haven't asked him. I mean, uh, he knows, of course, that we're doing this. He's doing his. He knows how I feel about it. He hasn't told me if he's going to sign it or not. Grace? Uh, just following up on that, so do you envision if he's, you know, let's say he does sign it, uh, or here's a different question. If he doesn't sign it or he vetoes it, is the council prepared to override his veto? Yes. And um, so then do you envision having two? I mean, I have to talk to my colleagues, but we'll see what happens with the vote today. But I would assume that ends up being what we would do. So our timeline is, as uh, the borough president uh, said in her remarks, we want this to not be a rushed process. We actually really want to look at the structure of city government, uh, advise and consent of potential mayoral appointees, uh, independent budgeting for the public advocate, the conflict of interest board, the borough presidents, the controller, um, and other agencies that currently do not have it but should. Uh, the land use process, units of appropriation, all of these things, uh, the law department, the things that uh, haven't been looked at really since 1989 through multiple charter revision commissions. And so we don't want to rush that process. So we're going to get the commission up and going. We haven't um, had the conversation yet about hiring staff. I haven't sat down and talked um, to individual um, folks that are going to play a part in picking commissioners. So we're at the beginning of it. The mayor's made clear he wants his commission to start to meet, I think, pretty quickly, meet over the summer, have things ready for November. I would envision that this commission, though, again, we're not in charge of this commission. We're going to appoint and we're going to work with them. We're going to testify, but they're going to be an independent commission that uh, they're hopefully going to put things on the ballot in November of 2019. So the mayor would be November of 2018, and we would likely be November of 2019, this commission. Rich? Councilmember Torres has been talking about this. And again, what I've said is we believe in a strong, robust, independent Department of Investigation and inspectors general at agencies across the city. And so again, I don't want to predetermine or you know, decide what this uh, Charter Revision Commission looks at. But I assume that individual council members are probably going to go testify at the Charter Revision Commission, asking them to look at particular things. Councilmember Torres has made very clear what his thoughts on it are. My guiding principle is a strong, independent, robust uh, commissioner of the Department of Investigations and inspectors general at agencies across the city. Okay. You know, I, right now there is a process in place. So the process it's simply, it's well, it's never been done before. It's unprecedented. So right now the, the process of if the mayor decided that he did want to terminate the current commissioner, there'd have to be a hearing at DCAS and it's sort of uncharted waters because it's never happened before. That's the thing. We're not sure who decides after that because it's never happened before. Um, Councilmember Torres has outlined pretty specifically how he thinks we should amend the city charter. Um, I want us to have a strong, independent Department of Investigation, and I'm open to this Charter Revision Commission looking at all the things I talked about. Anyone else? Uh, Grace? So um, this is Councilmember Levine's bill, so I'm happy to have him speak on this if he wants to add something to what I'm about to say, um, as well as Councilmember Rosenthal, who's been the real leader on this. But what I would say is we want transparency. So we want to know from um, elected offices, from city agencies, from the mayor's office, from every office, the number of complaints that have been put forward on sexual harassment. 
I believe we don't have those numbers. And I don't even know if these numbers are being tracked right now, which is part of the problem. Again, it goes to what Councilmember Levine said when he spoke a few moments ago, which is we don't really have the data right now and have never had the data to understand if there are trends, if there are certain areas where it's been more pervasive and more insidious. So this is about getting that data. Um, I don't believe we requested that from the mayor's office, uh, but the, the goal of this is to get every single city agency, the council, the public advocate, the controller, the borough presidents, to report this on an annual basis so we can look at it. Is there anything you wanted to add? May I? Yes, okay. of course. I just want to add that for the hearing, we did request mm -hmm. that information, and we've been told over and over again it's coming. Um, they are, DCAS is required to collect this information. Um, there's no requirement on how the information is to be transferred from an agency to DCAS, right? All of these issues, all of the sexual harassment related issues have been sitting in a dustbin for so long, just collecting cobwebs. And this is the first time, I mean, this is sort of why I think it's so revolutionary. Within three months of starting as speaker, we're passing these bills that are going to require the city in this in instance to set up a system, which I don't believe exists to collect the information, substantiate, you know, substantiated claims, and then the consequences of what those claims are, and then that information becomes public. Um, it's it's going to be able to answer the questions that we all have. That's the power of the bill. We, yeah, thank you. Thank, no, thank you, Helen. Uh, I also want to uh, add that it's important to say this, we have been working on these package bills collaboratively with the other side of City Hall and with the law department. They've been a real partner in this with us. They've been willing to amend things and have been flexible. When Councilman Rosenthal has flagged issues, which he has on a bunch of the bills, they've worked with us um, on this. So we're grateful for their partnership on this. And I believe they're committed to this. And I believe the mayor will sign this entire package of bills into law. Yes, Noah. To follow up on uh, <coughs> Yes. Part of the investigation, but it's a part of determining what the penalty should be. Were they a part of that process? Is our general counsel here? Is Jason Otonio here? Um, so we can get back to you on this. They were, I can't say specifically which part of the process they were involved in, because I want to be clear and, and be precise with you and accurate on it, but they were, they were part of the process. I don't know if they were part of it, determining what the uh, penalty was going to be. Um, we can get you that information if we're allowed to share that with you. Again, we want to protect this person, um, but they were part of the process. Um, they were involved from the beginning of the process until the end of the process. And I have another question not directly related to today, but um, you all have 60 days, you, the mayor, and the citywide council of presidents and NYCHA uh, from last week to appoint an independent emergency manager. Um, what's the status of that process? Is the ball gotten rolling? The clock is ticking, and uh, I have not, uh, I look forward to having uh, a conversation um, with uh, Danny Barber, which I haven't had the opportunity to do yet, and I really respect him. He's been a great tenant leader in our city, and um, the mayor and I have spoken briefly about it, but not in specifics, not identifying potential people who could be the monitor. So we will have those conversations. Of course, Councilmember Amprey Samuel will be part of that conversation as chair of the Committee on Public Housing. And when we have more information, we will share it. We don't have any information yet on that. Um, we're still, you know, there's still people who are analyzing the executive order, which is pretty far reaching. Rich? So uh, up till now, at least, the mayor has seemed immovable on having the city pay for the fair fare. Do you think that he can be moved? And you called it today a cornerstone and a pillar of your negotiations. Uh, are you going to be moved in the opposite direction? I mean, uh, it just seems like a pretty serious clash going on. Uh, I don't know if we're dancing. I don't know if, if, there's, if this is a, 
you know, playing chicken or, you know, I, I think the mayor believes that we should have a millionaire's tax that pays for this. That's dead on arrival in Albany, at least in the current form of government in Albany. The state legislature is not passing it before the end of the legislative session. Um, and the governor hasn't said, I believe that he supports it in its current form. We believe this is such a priority that we can find the city resources um, to pay for this. And given the number of council members that were on the record long before yesterday and years preceding uh, this announcement of including it as a cornerstone in our budget response, uh, I believe there's widespread, nearly unanimous support in the body. We saw three district attorneys. We saw the Bronx Borough President. We saw the public advocate and the controller. We saw one of the mayor's appointees to the MTA board, David Jones. We saw union leaders. We've seen almost four dozen community-based organizations uh, that have supported this. And again, I believe, and I don't mean this, this is not personal, uh, nothing's personal, it's on policy, that the mayor ran on a tale of two cities. And as I said at this press conference today, um, if you can't afford to get on the subway, you're not in either one of those two cities. I don't know where you are. So this is really in line, I think, with his values. It's in line with our values. And we believe that this would be something that he would get a lot of credit for, for doing, and is the right thing to do. Have you had any preliminary conversations with him about? about not detailed conversations, but uh, yesterday he called it a noble idea. At his press conference in the Rockaways, he said that this is a noble idea, and I agree with him, it's a noble idea. It's a noble idea that we seek to have fully funded in this year's budget. Anyone else? Noah. Um, on that, just how far are you willing to go to make sure that that's included in the budget? What, what step do you want to take? I mean, I, we still have a significant amount of the process left. So we did our response. The mayor will release his executive budget. Uh, by the end of this month, um, we will then have executive budget hearings that will finish uh, towards the end of May. And then as soon as those executive budget hearings end, we will go into negotiations for the adopted budget. So we're at the beginning of the process. The preliminary budget response is, again, the beginning of our negotiations in the budget process. We'll continue to have conversations. I think you're going to continue to see more support that gets announced throughout the entire city on this important issue. And um, I hope that the mayor will include this in the executive budget. If he doesn't, we will continue to push him up to the adopted budget to include this. Anyone else? Thank you all very much.